So, Mark, did you see that commercial from Maxim from the 1980s? Uh, this is a place that's still around the Westin over off East Flamingo. I used to go there all the time. We used to have a small casino, sort of played up that off strip sort of feel. Cool to see this retro look back at a place that a lot of people just don't even pay attention to. Yeah, I didn't even realize it was Maxim back then when I saw this on the show notes. I was like, oh, Maxim Magazine, is that still a thing? Are they doing something big in Vegas? And then I watched the video and I was like, oh, that's so old school. I love it. Uh, it's cool to see. But yeah, definitely a property people kind of overlook and, and don't think about that much. Yeah, I went through a lot of financial problems through the 90s, got sold a bunch of times, eventually became the Westin. Uh, just a few years ago, they closed the casino down completely. So it is gone. It's just a hotel. A fun family fact for me, and this is the Vegas Thanksgiving that you always wanted. The first year we moved here, we did Thanksgiving at the Maxim at the buffet there. That's how Vegas nice. families used to do it back in the day. <laughs> no, it's actually a cool hotel. Like, a de- not cool, but it's a decent hotel. If you have point Marriott points, it's right down the strip. Easy walk. Uh, we've had friends stay there. A normal hotel in the middle of Vegas. It's perfect. It's right on the F1 uh, route. So they get great views of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Nuclear testing has returned to Nevada. What a crazy story. I guess Russia has backed out of the treaty that says that the U.S. and Russia aren't going to test nuclear weapons. And so the U.S. government said, hey, we're going to test it. We're going to try to figure out how we can hear nuclear weapons being launched in other countries uh, through the sounds. And maybe we'll do nuclear tourism again. Who knows? Yeah, it's such a random thing. Like, you don't expect this to just go off. And they said they weren't going to do anything until we did something. And then we're like, right away, oh, well, we're going to do it first. I don't know. I'm not big into politics, but it just seems like a weird decision. Hopefully it works out for the best. I don't know, but something new for Vegas to talk about. So that's good for us. Yeah. And for people who don't know, they were testing uh, nuclear weapons, I think, all the way through the 2000s out at the Nevada test site. It was a long time. I knew somebody who worked out there who was involved in those tests. They were all buried and they would study all the effects on the environment and, and all of that. And it reminds me as a kid going to elementary, middle school here, uh, they would do these drills for like radioactive waste. They were building that Yucca Mountain repository there where they were going to put all their nuclear waste. So instead of earthquake drills or something, they would have nuclear waste drills in case nuclear waste got spilled and you would go run under your desk and they would tape the door and that was supposed to protect you. All that, that good masking tape. Fun fact, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came from Nevada, just so you know. Well, that leads us perfectly into the next story, <laughs> which is Lon Love's best cities for surviving the zombie apocalypse. And I, you know, Lon Love, I know we've covered one of their lists before, and I don't know, I enjoy this list for some reason. I think it's unique, right? They came up with this idea of how you would survive. Uh, is the city walkable? How many sort of firearm stores? How many grocery stores do they have? Stuff like that. And Detroit, number 194, you're done in the zombie apocalypse. Well, I mean, that's Detroit City. Uh, yeah, probably not the best. There's not a ton of stuff to survive, but I think everybody would move out. And I know Vegas was ranked high, but if we go with like state, and I'm a big, uh, a big Walking Dead fan, all that stuff, zombie stuff, I love it also. Uh, I thought, I didn't think anybody had this on their bingo card, their MTM bingo card, zombie apocalypse talk. But uh, I think as a state, Michigan would be a good one, good natural resources, you know, forest, hunting, fishing, all that stuff. I would not want to be in Nevada. There's not a lot. I mean, are you going to drink from Lake Mead? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're number eight. Okay, you're number one ninety four. So yeah. our walkability isn't good, but the it's health the of the citizens. Courts. Yeah, <laughs> but we have a lot of hunting gear stores apparently in supermarkets. So like, once you ran out of all the supplies, I guess the modern supplies, then you'd be kind of screwed because you're stuck in the middle of the desert uh, compared yeah. to to Michigan. But what an interesting idea for which city to go to. And I know people are basing their moving decisions purely on this list from Lon Love. But yeah, Vegas beats Detroit again. That's the headline. <laughs> Whatever you got to do, whatever you got to do. There you go. All right. And uh, some sad news came out of Laughlin. Don Laughlin died. And, you know, it's interesting every time we talk about Laughlin to think that the guy who formed the city, whose name the city is named after, still was alive. He lived in his Riverside Casino and he was 92 years old. He finally passed away. I didn't realize sort of his history reading this article about it. He operated a casino in North Las Vegas for 10 years sold it, then bought this like out of business motel in what is now Laughlin after flying over it and the rest is history. He even spent the money to build that bridge between Bullhead City and Laughlin that goes over the river. Uh, This man was the visionary for this town. It grew out of that. A sad day, I think, for Southern Nevada and a guy you don't, you know, hear talked about as much, but certainly one of the old school moguls of the gaming industry here. Yeah, it was a really crazy story. And you think like, oh, this must have happened in like the 1800s, but it was, you know, 50, 60 years ago, which 
isn't that long ago. It kind of blows your mind that a guy pretty much started like almost like the Wild Wild West started a, a town out of nothing when he was younger was putting in uh, slots into bars and making more money than his principal and the principal said you either you need to do slots or school and he said well I'm gonna do slots because I'm making triple your salary and then opened up this casino and I think it said it had eight slots and two table games when they opened the first casino in Laughlin like why would anybody be there go there it just it's crazy it, and to start from that and build up uh, what we've seen and and he said he saw it flying over his in his plane saw the land saw the river that river does look picturesque whenever you see it so pretty cool yeah it's nuts he was a teenager buying slot machines which were illegal from mail order catalogs then going into pubs and <laughs> selling them and splitting the thing i mean you talk about somebody who's just wired for this sort of stuff uh, and then as you said he goes out to laughlin i think there was eight rooms in the motel to start half of them were taken up by his family you know adds 50 rooms adds 60 rooms here and then eventually towers and now there's 1300 rooms at riverside and the rest of the city has grown around it so certainly a visionary and his own name on the city and i always thought it was cool when you were there uh, even though it's not really a city actually it's just part of clark county it's just a township but uh, i always thought it was so cool that he was there and uh, may he rest in peace. You're going to see Laughlin for the first time coming up in a month, month and a half. So uh, no Don Laughlin there for you, but you'll get to see the city that he built. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you know, definitely something I've been wanting to do. And I know people people make jokes in the comments like there's nothing there or, or whatever, but it's something cool. And, you know, they said people across the river in, the other, in Arizona would see the lights at night and it would draw them over and just kind of the history of it and and somebody kind of building this out of nothing makes it something unique that you don't really see anymore. And it, it wasn't all that long ago. I mean, the guy was still alive up until last week. So it's just, it, it kind of adds more excitement for me to it, to hear this backstory now of how it all began. As a reminder, our Patreon is now going, patreon.com forward slash MTM Vegas. We do a weekly after show, release it on Fridays. You can listen to it. You can watch it. Hope to see you over there, patreon.com forward slash MTM Vegas. Thanks everyone for your support. So we have talked sports a lot on this show but we have not talked about the rebels the football team six and one mark the, they're eligible for a bowl game for the first time since 2013 not only that they have one of the best records in all of college football when are they going to be the national champions i mean i've been waiting for this forever <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i mean it's sad i have to admit that they have a better football team than michigan state which you never would think any other time, but uh, that's what happens when your coach gets fired two games in. Anyway, you know, UNLV has always been known for basketball back in the day and never really known for football. They just have always been one of the worst teams in the country. Them and UConn were always towards the bottom, and both those schools last couple of years have been improving, so it's cool to see. Now you just have to hope you hold on to that coach because you know people are going to come uh, bidding for him uh, when they have a bigger job opening, but it's cool to see, and they still got a lot of season left, so they got other things they can do and work their way up the bowl list. Yeah, let's hope they don't stop here and then just like lose everything and get one of the, the worst uh, bowls. But the yeah, Sean this Jinx. is great. <laughs> <laughs> they have a state-of-the-art facility they play in. Uh, this was sort of the hope with Allegiant and bringing this this program into the future. I remember when they brought in John Robinson, USC's ex-coach, maybe in the mid-2000s. That was supposed to be the resurgence of the program. They would go to a, a bowl game occasionally, but this is the probably the best that they've been. So it's good to see. And they get any support. They beat Reno. They got the cannon. So uh, we're all good with that and good to show them some love. UNLV, go Rebels, man. Go Rebels. I still think that's the best way to check out the stadium too their tickets are so much cheaper if you want to get in there for something just to see what allegiance like that's the way to really do it i think so when we were young was here and that this is the festival aimed at people our age right the, the people who are now a little bit older and those nostalgic acts from the 90s like green day i think blink 182 was there i mean so many acts were there right we saw the the list of all of the acts it seems like it went pretty well and uh, a lot of uh, middle-aged people having fun yeah what well, sixty five thousand, i think they had there which when you think of the ticket prices that's nuts but there was so many bands they're splitting it up all these different ways so it doesn't go as far as you would think but it looked uh, it looked crazy. It looked kind of like a mini Woodstock almost with, with all the people, like the sea of people out there. And Green Day seems to put on a good show, released a new song, which is cool to see. And I don't know, did you see that they were selling like a little seven inch vinyl of that song that you could only get at that uh, concert, which I think is something unique that people would take away from that. And I'd buy it. I mean, that'd be something cool to put in, on your wall. They probably only made, you know, 60, 70,000 of them, if even that. Yeah, the, we've seen so many music festivals come the last few years, and they all have different sort of target demographics. But this is the coolest one uh, for obvious reasons. Like I said, it's really uh, targeted at people our age with the acts that uh, they had. And it's been successful. I think this was their second year. And this is just a reminder that 
when you look at like events or you want to come to Las Vegas for the weekend, it's not just the big events. Uh, obviously, this is a big event, but there are so many music festivals and so many different things going on that rates can be crazy. So any given weekend, uh, it can be nuts with these giant festivals. But this is a good one. I hope it goes for many years to come. Definitely seems like people are happy to support it. They like the acts and they're delivering the product in the end, which is good to see. Yeah, I, I think it's a festival everybody was really excited about. So I'm glad that it went off without a hitch. Everybody had a good time. You know, we've seen crazy things happen at festivals in Vegas and outside of Vegas with stampedings and shootings and everything like that. So it's great when one a big event like this goes off and nothing happens. There's nothing to talk about uh, that aspect. So I'm glad to see that. So Cirque is turning 30, or they are 30 years on the Las Vegas Strip, and they are giving 30% off tickets for locals. I do think it's been fairly easy to find bigger discounts than that. You know, lately, depending on the show, uh, 30 to 50% off, they, they're offering all the time. But if you are a local, want to go to the show, that's going to be all five of their shows on the Strip. Everything from Matt Apple to Michael Jackson, Ka, and the other ones to Love and uh, O oh at Bellagio. No, and, and that's the crazy thing. Like years ago, 10 years ago or whatever, you never saw Cirque shows discounted or on sale or anything. You know, they, they would never be at Tickets for Less or, or any type of discounts that I could come up with. So you always had to pay face value and they're always so popular. It kind of just goes to show that we've, you know, we've been talking about this, that those kind of shows are kind of fading away. And hopefully this gives them a nice little boost and people go out and support it but it seems like this is kind of the end or towards the end of that run that for those shows yeah we talked about how awakening struggling and these are the big production shows now of course the Cirque ones have been around depending on the show for a long time and the money sort of sunk into them but we won't see any of these huge investments in these types of shows anymore if these shows don't do well and who knows how long the Cirque shows will all go uh, we know love probably going away next year uh, after the transition to hard rock but we need more of this we need unique shows in las vegas we don't need residencies. I mean, I love residencies. They're great. They play a part. Don't get me wrong at all. But we don't want all residencies. We want unique entertainment on the Strip. So support Cirque, 30% off for locals. Go see them. So we talked about Formula One and how they're, I don't know, not planning so well with the construction and everything else. But I guess somebody has listened because for the Super Bowl, we're actually planning ahead. And I'm very impressed by this. Uh, we've talked about how they're redoing the whole TROP interchange, which they're rebuilding the bridges and everything else. That's like a multi-year project that they're in the middle of, but they're actually fast-tracking half the bridge to get done before the Super Bowl, and they're going to have the whole bridge open because they won't tear down the second half of the bridge till after the Super Bowl. This is smart planning. Like, what, is this Las Vegas? I don't even know I'm what a, the heck we're doing here. I'm surprised. Guess what they're getting rid of, too, Sean? The, yeah, the diverging diamond. Just temporarily, <laughs> yes. though. Yes, it's sad, but most of the time cities do not think this forward and come up with a plan that makes sense. And this is great to see, and it should make things so much easier. Already probably going to be less congested than F1 uh, with all that's going on with that. So it'll be cool to have it open. Everybody will get a taste of it. They'll be all excited driving around, and then they'll go back to construction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then they'll knock the other sucker down. But this yeah. is great planning and uh, good to see it. They talked about the security zone for Allegiant Stadium, how it's going to be much wider than for a normal Raiders game. So the area is still going to be a mess, but at least they'll have that extra throughput on the Tropicana Bridge. And they're actually paying overtime. They're trying to rush this project to get it done by the Super Bowl. So it wasn't even the normal timeline. Like I said, they're thinking ahead. Uh, not thinking ahead. I don't know, F1. We're trying not to talk about them too much. But they abruptly canceled one of their grandstands this week, saying that the views would be obstructed. And then they moved everybody to the uh, T-Mobile grandstand, which was an upgrade. I think the grandstand that people were in was $500 less than the one they got moved to. We suspect that this is probably from low demand and not a obstructed view, but it is what it is. They're cutting down the grandstands. Yeah, it has to be. It doesn't make any other sense. Like, you know what it's going to look like before you build it there. So that's my guess. And I love how they're like, oh, it's $500 more expensive where we're moving you. Well, that was on day one. Who knows what they're selling for these days. But I do think it's just they didn't want a grandstand that was kind of half empty. It would look terrible on TV. So it makes sense to consolidate it some. And we've seen that with the slow rolling out of other people's grandstands over time. They didn't try to flood it all at once. And that was probably best because maybe they there were some that they were going to unveil and they didn't. Uh, they've held them back and all that stuff. But I have to imagine this is demand causing this. We'll see. That that wasn't so bad for an F1 story. Uh, just talking about this. We were We were very nice and... We're hoping that they uh, <laughs> that they fill up their grandstands. So let's close with this, Mark. 
uh, Jacob's Life in Vegas, he posted on Twitter about Caesars, talking about Park MGM, how the, that's MGM's non-smoking casino. What would be Caesars non-smoking casino? Uh, because Park MGM has been successful. We both stayed there since it's been non-smoking. I've stayed there quite a few times at Nomad and at Park MGM. I do like it. I like that you're not getting bombarded with smoke. I think they pulled it off. I think the vibe of the casino could be a little bit more lively. But which Caesars Casino, if they did it? I have to think this has got to be on their bingo card for them to try this uh, because it has been successful at Park MGM. Yeah, I, I mean, I want to say Paris, but the French love to smoke so much. I don't know if that would go. <laughs> it wouldn't be uh, It wouldn't be authentic if, uh, you know, you're in there and, and not smoke. I, mean, I think that would actually make kind of similar sense to a Park MGM to that, you know, level, the design of it and everything, the niceness of it. I kind of feel like that would be one, a good one. I doubt they're going to do it at Caesars Palace. Uh, you know, Harrah's is kind of a lower end. Flamingo, definitely not. So I kind of feel like in, in Planet Hollywood's like more of a party atmosphere. So Paris is kind of where I'm standing. So there's two options, I think, here. Cromwell, but it's too small yeah. and it really sort of that's their boutique sort of brand. So they probably don't want to make that non-smoking to keep everybody out. I think Horseshoe is the answer to this question yeah. because it's connected to Paris. Uh, so you're connected to other properties, but uh, it's been renovated. It's an older casino, so it doesn't have the huge ceilings. So it could benefit from being smoke-free a little bit more, but they're surrounded on all sides by other Caesars properties where you could smoke. And as you said, the Flamingo, Link, Harris, there's just too much of that other type of smoke that you could never get rid of to try to make those properties <laughs> non-smoking. In fact, those are almost like smoking friendly at this point. Yeah, I think that they just kind of fit into that mold. Uh, so the this, I could see Bally's too, or Horseshoe, sorry. I still want to call it Bally's. But I could see that being a good one. And it, it is a smaller casino. It's not the most lively of places either. I've never like gone in there and been like, oh, this is great. So I could see why that would be a good fit. Kind of the Park MGM, uh, where they're, the casino is just kind of mellow, kind of chill. Bally's is kind of along those lines. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, so let us know what you guys think. I think this is an interesting... Did I say Bally's again? What... <laughs> <laughs> What's the prediction though? Like, do you think that they'll do this? I mean... When it first happened, there were people saying, oh, it'll never work. By all accounts, Park MGM has been successful as a non-smoking casino. Do you think Caesars will follow suit? It's been a couple of years now. Yeah, I think you have to. I mean, you have that demographic out there that just really doesn't like smoking. And if they have other options with your competition and that they can go to, they're going to go there and you're losing out on those players. So I think making one, I don't think it's going to be like a mass everywhere, uh, but turning one of them into it, I think would it would make a lot of sense. So let us know what you guys think about that, uh, about the zombie apocalypse. Would you rather be in Detroit or Las Vegas? Uh, Don Laughlin dying and his legacy down in Laughlin. Everything we've talked about here, go Rebels, all that great stuff. Hit us up in the comments. We do two shows a week, Tuesdays and Fridays. We'll be back in just a couple days with another show. Don't forget to hit us up on Patreon as well. Thanks so much for watching. Talk to you next time. I'm just going to call it Bally's for life. There we go. <laughs> Have a good week, everybody.